First up, I'd like to introduce Chris Berg, um, and he'll let you know what he's going to speak about. <laughs> can, can I close this? Can I close this screen? That's all good? All right. Um, uh, no, 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 I can't close it. Did I kill it? Yeah. Oh, well. Oh, wait. Wow. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much for that um, uh, introduction. Um, when I, w I spoke to Tim Andrews about uh, this session, uh, he asked me to speak about Libertarianism 101, rather than Econ 101. Don't fear, there will be an Econ 101 talk from Sinclair in just a moment, but I'm going to start by talking about Libertarianism, um, uh, uh, an introduction to Libertarianism. It will make more sense and it will be more useful than you think. Um, because uh, the way I understand libertarianism and the way I'm going to argue for libertarianism um, it, it will actually be the foundations of, of much of what Sinclair's argument is, you know, what you really need to know about economics as well. Um, so as it was mentioned, I, um, uh, uh, my name is Chris Berg. I'm with RMIT, the IPA. I'm also with the Australian Taxpayers Alliance. My, uh, I'm going to give a Libertarianism 101 talk. Last year, I published a book basically on this, The Libertarian Alternative, which was the first book about libertarianism in Australia in 40 years. It's available at all bookstores and on Kindle. Don't be embarrassed to buy the book on your phone now. I'll wait. <laughs> Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, www.amazon.com slash libertarian alternative Chris Berg, ebook slash dp slash b01dydfo8w. Good. Good. <laughs> so, okay. Because you obviously haven't had time to read the book yet, what is libertarianism? Let me give the quick answer first. Libertarianism is the political philosophy of liberty, of freedom, understood as the minimization of government coercion and the maximization of individual choice. From these basic precepts, libertarian thinkers and policy specialists have applied those principles to public policy across the board. Libertarianism tells us that we should be able to trade with each other voluntarily and according to our own understanding of our best interests, because trade makes voluntarily trade, makes people, each person, party to that trade, better off. Trade across national borders should be free. And people should be able to sell their labor at a price of their own choosing. In other words, there ought to be no constraints on like the minimum wage. There should be few, few government controls on trade, economic activity, and social activity. That is, there should be limited red tape and regulation. Government should be small and tax little. Civil society should be allowed to flourish and charity and social protection along with it. Our preferences are our business, so no to the nanny state. People should be free to seek and pursue the lives they want. This leads us to one controversial position these days. My argument is that libertarians should support significantly expanded immigration and see the backlash against immigration as profoundly anti-libertarian, but let's let, leave that kettle of fish for questions. Anyway, libertarianism looks like a very radical program. It's neither really left or right, and the word, the word appears in the political sense really only in the late 19th century, and many explicitly libertarian institutions, like the Libertarian Party in the United States, are barely half a century old. We had a short-lived Libertarian Party in the 1970s, the Work Workers' Party, of course, and the Liberal Democrats, who um, was... Uh, uh, who is, of course, enjoying Senate representation with David Leonhelm, at the moment was founded uh, just less than two decades ago. But libertarianism is heir to a much older tradition, the liberalism of John Locke and Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill. Our libertarianism today would be nothing without the radical anti-authoritarianism of Locke, the anti-establishment market economics of Smith and Mill, Mill's deep understanding of the relationship between liberty and human flourishing. And so in that context, what I want to do today is draw attention to Australia's lost and forgotten libertarian heritage. That liberalism of Locke and Smith and Mill was a dominant and substantial intellectual tradition in Australia during the 19th century. 19th century colonists stocked their libraries with these great English liberal authors. They argued over free trade and individual rights. They published books on liberalism and liberal economics that were globally recognized at the time as classics. 
and still appear on, um, on sites of uh, liberalism and uh, libertarian content today. It is those liberals, indeed, who fought, fought hardest against the white Australia policy when it was introduced at the urging of the labor movement. The fact that this tradition went into hiding during the 20th century, the fact that you need less than one hand to count the number of conservative and liberal historians of Australia that have explored this, should not blind us to our great intellectual heritage. So why would one support libertarian ideas? There are a lot of approaches you can take to the philosophy of liberty. Many libertarians are attracted to the idea of a non-aggression aggression principle, which says that aggression or the initiation of force of violence is inherently illegitimate, whether that aggression comes from an individual or individuals acting as a government. I'd like to propose another reason, however, to be attracted to libertarianism, which I lay out in the book. Libertarianism is designed to deal with the two great challenges of social organization, that of knowledge and that of power. Utopian socialists and utopian conservatives have long imagined societies ordered by benevolent governments. But any historical attempt to bring those societies into being has floundered on the fact that governments just are not all-seeing and all-knowing. When Joseph Stalin was trying to centrally plan the economy of the Russian Empire, his Politburo, that is the, basically the cabinet of the Soviet Union, had to deal with upwards of a thousand agenda items per meeting as they tried to push resources back and forth throughout the Soviet economy. In societies more caring about individual rights than Stalin's Russia, of course, the knowledge problem is even worse. Stalin didn't have to worry about what people wanted. Modern governments have to at least pretend to try, but how on earth can governments know what people want, at what price, under what circumstances? How can governments know what lives to lead? This is a very roundabout way of talking about Hayek's knowledge problem, the first problem of social organization. The second problem is power. We don't trust governments. We can't trust governments. This is not because government is full of villains, although obviously that's true, <laughs> but, it is, but because it is full of people, mostly normal people who want what mostly normal people want. They want money, they want luxury, they want a cushy job, they want prestige, they want authority, sometimes they want control. And university professors, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Governments, university professors. People are lazy and greedy, again, university professors. <laughs> Giving people government roles with coercive power over others brings out their worst. This is the problem of incentives. Even if a government could know and see everything, we could never trust it to do so in our interests. My argument is that these twin challenges suggest to us that government should be small. It should be strictly and constitutionally limited. It should keep out of things it has no business being in. It should maximize individual rights and minimize its control over our lives. That is why libertarianism. Because government isn't magic. It's just a <laughs> bunch of flawed, ignorant people with guns. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to draw out, and perhaps this is useful for discussion later. I'd like to draw out one distinction that is particularly relevant in today's libertarian discussions. This is the idea of thick libertarianism versus thin libertarianism. Thin libertarianism says that libertarianism is concerned with one thing and one thing only, the proper use of the coercive power of the state. Thick libertarianism says that libertarianism is a more all-encompassing ethical doctrine about individual worth, the nature of non-coercive relationships, and even about culture. As I've said, libertarianism is a political philosophy. It's political in the sense that it's concerned with the organization of a society of individuals and groups. That's the thin libertarian model. But if it is to be meaningful as a philosophy, in my view, it is important for libertarians to reckon with the implications of their belief in individual worth and value. What that means for our understanding of democracy and democratic institutions, of notions of community and foreignness, of the exclusion of groups of people from social traditions. One reason I think that the, li the, that the thick libertarian vision is most compelling is because it recognizes the tradition from which our libertarianism grew out. An anti-authoritarian tradition, anti-imperial, 
pro-toleration, pro-tolerance, anti-censorship, but most of all, a tradition that held a deep concern for human flourishing and individual, individual self-worth. Now, having very unsatisfactorily opened that giant can of worms, mm. I'd like to ask Sinclair Davidson to the podium.